Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Headquarters Air Force Personnel Center Readiness Cell Updates Defensive Collaboration Services. Today's DCS is being conducted by the Headquarters AFPC Airmen and Family Operations Readiness Cell. The Readiness Cell comprises of Mr. Nathaniel Hudson, HC Functional Manager, Mrs. Glenda Alexander, Deployment Support Program Manager, and myself, Angela Cotman, Crisis Support Program Manager. We are incorporating a new approach to training. This webcast is pre-recorded. The goal is for Airmen and Family Readiness Center staff to view the presentation during their staff meeting or training. Today's presentation will take about 45 minutes with discussion at the conclusion of the training. Today's webcast will provide updates of the 8C career field, deployment support program, crisis support desk guide revisions, AFPAS updates, crisis event metrics, new initiatives, and takeaways. We will begin with updates from Mr. Nate Hudson. Nate. The Air Force made significant changes to the Developmental Special Duty Program to better facilitate the local hire assignment process. Can you expand on some of the program procedural changes? Angela, thanks for asking. Beginning with the DSD fall cycle, August 2019 through February 2020, report no later than dates, four local hire DSD enlisted special duties are no longer managed through the DSD process. Airmen are selected through a new local hire procedure outlined in the Personnel Services Delivery Guide titled the Local Hire Assignment Process for Special Duty Identifiers or SDIs. The four local hire DSDs are Career Assistant Advisor, Airman Dorm Leader, PME Airman Leadership School Instructor Only, and Airmen and Family Readiness Center Readiness NCO. The new process provides the base level manager of the SDI to advertise and select volunteers from local resources. SDIs filled via local hire processes are still controlled by AFPC DP2OSS in coordination with the AFPC Functional Assignment Manager or FAM for release prior to selecting a volunteer is still accomplished. It is important that local hiring authorities communicate with Wing Command Chief Master Sergeants or Wing CCMs to ensure special duty assignment and special duty identifier HC needs are met. For example, identification of assignment backfills for end of controlled or stabilized tours retirements, extensions, and for best job fit considerations during vectoring and nomination process. Also, ensure that SDI HC control and duty Air Force skill codes or AFSCs are updated. The duty AFSC denotes the specialty in which the individual is performing duty. The control AFSC is a management tool used to make enlisted airmen assignments, to assist in determining training requirements, and to consider individuals for promotion. Also, in regards to control AFSCs, remember that current Air Force policy in AFI 10-403 states enlisted are tasked for deployments based upon their control, AFSC. Now that Air University has announced the FY20 Airmen and Family Readiness Basic Course dates, what key considerations for supervisors of new, what are the key considerations for supervisors of newly hired personnel? Thanks, Angela. Good question. Air University's Force Support Professional Development School confirmed dates in December 2019, March and July 
2020 for the Airman and Family Readiness Basic Course at Air University, Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. The course director will email the student nomination requests to flight chiefs and air reserve component functionals for the MFHRMS 408 FY20 courses. The field should see the email 30 to 60 days prior to course start date. Now a reminder, per the Air Force Enlisted Classification Directory, completion of the Air University ANFR basic course within 12 months of initial assignment in the SDI-8C is mandatory. And per AFI 36309, flight chiefs should ensure all staff are nominated to attend the Air University Airman and Family Readiness Basic Course within 12 months of initial hire. Where can airmen and supervisors find additional information on the new DSD process? Links to access the updated DSD program guidance and information are now listed. Next, we'll have deployment support updates from Glenda Alexander. Glenda, I understand there is a working group focused on the needs of civilian deployers. Can you share more information about that? Civilian deployments are a hot topic presently at OSD, DLD, and HAF. It is imperative that centers include the special population in all of their readiness and deployment support services. Recently, OSD coordinated a deployment program manager expeditionary force working group, which meets by conference call every other month. This group is comprised of policy and operation level total force deployment program managers and representatives from such agencies as DLD, DLA, non-appropriated fund, and even HR professionals. Group members have been asked to provide input toward revisions to the Military One Source Plan My Deployment tools, specifically to include information relevant to civilian deployers. We are also reviewing deployment research and relevant tasks and duties specific to de civilian deployers. What are the requirements for deployment presentations and can centers opt to provide handouts in place of briefings? Glad you asked that question, Nate. DOTI 1342.22 Military Family Readiness states that family readiness centers will provide assistance for all four phases of deployment. AFI 36-3009 specifically states centers will administer briefings and presentations even for short notice or just-in-time situations. Passing out handouts or booklets should not be used as a replacement for a briefing or a presentation. All slides and handouts should look professional. Using either an Air Force, Wing, or local FSS, FSS slide template is recommended. Tongue and quell also can be used as a, a means of preparing slides. Working group teams have recently developed briefing slides for all phases of deployment, and thanks to those teams for the hard work they provided. Once those have been approved, the slide templates will be loaded in there first for use by the um, Airmen and Family Readiness Centers. I'd also like to mention that some centers are using humor and cartoons in their briefings, which is discouraged. Deployments are viewed as serious, life-changing events, and we won't necessarily know the customer's emotional or psychological state. Also, some clients may be stressed or anxious. Of course, a humorous situation might come up naturally during your presentations, that's okay but it should not be artificially included as an aspect of your briefings. Our goal is to be professional, 
provide required information in a concise and timely manner, and to release the customer to get on with their duties. Thank you, Glenda. Department of Defense instruction and Air Force instructions require all deployers with the taskings of 30 plus days to have a briefing at the ANFRC. How are centers accomplishing this task? Honestly, some centers report that they are successful in working with their local IDOs and readiness PLCs to meet this requirement. Other centers, however, are struggling getting deployers to attend the briefings, and they actually, actually admit to not knowing who has 30 or more day deployment taskings. For those centers having problems, we recommend starting with their local readiness cell, request monthly products so they can monitor who's deploying from their installation, and monitor the deployment numbers on AEF online. Those metrics might actually help uh, toward determining gaps in service delivery. Another recommendation is to have the flight chief bring this to the attention of the FSS and wing leadership. Mention these issues at the CAT and the CAP, for example. Moreover, if a center is not getting all the required deployers to attend their briefings, they are missing out on fulfilling the primary goals of readiness and deployment support. Furthermore, centers not getting the required deployers might have the may not have the necessary information on families, since it's the military member that most often provides contact information on their loved ones. I would also like to mention the importance, again, of ensuring that deployment presentations are professional and engages the attention of deployers. Deployers must see what we are providing to them as beneficial, especially frequent deployers who should not be tortured by listening to the same briefing every time they deploy. Good facilitators consider the audience and use flexibility in how the information is presented based on the needs of the audience. Good information. Will there be a readiness training conference in 2020? I really hope so. Training is under consideration for FY20. Just to be clear, HAF determines annual training priorities. So it will be some time before we actually know if and when training gets approved. And we expect an increase in program obligations going forward. We are still advocating, however, for the training to occur next spring or fall, if approved. What can you tell us about financial readiness training, and what's the impact for deployment support? This is very exciting for deployment support. Personal and family readiness training is mandatory as of 15 November 19, although Training for pre-deployment and post-deployment would also be available online in ADLS. We are asking centers to encourage deployers to consider in-person training at the center. This is a great way for readiness NCOs or airmen and family staff to work closely with PFRs to get deployers to meet both mandatory requirements for personal and family readiness in one visit. That would be a win-win for all involved. Are there any trends you would like to mention for deployment support? Absolutely. We actually have four trends. The first one is deployment-related codes are not being utilized consistently and first. These codes are listed in the 2019 Deployment Support Guide and assist operations and half in tracking numbers specific to deployment support programs. When I checked recently, only two bases were using the required codes. The second trend is program brief briefing slides are not in an approved military format. That would be the Air Force, Wing, FSS, or even Tongue and Quill. Slides will need to be standardized going forward, particularly now that centers will be working closely with financial readiness whose slides were professionally developed. The third trend is Airman and Family Readiness Superintendent is being used as a title when it is not an authorized duty title. According to the Enlisted Classification Directory, 
dated 30 April 2019, SDI A Charlie's are Airmen and Family Readiness Center Readiness NCOs. Under the Air Force Handbook 36-2618, Enlisted Force Structure, a superintendent is in charge of squadron or wing level functions. NFRCs are flights, and readiness NCOs cannot officially supervise civilian employees at the GS 9 through 12 level. Centers do, the last one is centers do not have an adequate method of tracking deployers on 30 plus day deployment taskings. We recommend developing procedures at the installation level to track all deployers and a process to ensure DOTI and AFI requirements are being met. In summary, we realize the centers are doing a variety of wonderful services for deployers and their families. Going forward, we expect total force deployments to increase. Centers will need to look into what modifications are necessary to improve and expand services. They will also need to work hand in hand with their PFRs to ensure we meet both deployment and reintegration requirements for personal and family readiness. As always, it's important to document all the workload so we can credit centers with the work they are doing on behalf of the Air Force. Lastly, there are several questions that are, were provided to us, and these, those questions and answers are available on the briefing slides for each person to review. Thank you, Glenda, for the deployment support updates. Now, for FPAS updates, Angela, we have experienced multiple disasters impacting airmen and their families. Can you provide crisis support program updates? Why, yes, Glenda. In 2019, FPAS security measures have changed. In order to maintain the integrity of the system, force support users must log in every 90 days to maintain access. Email notifications are sent to case managers at the 30-day mark. Failure to comply will result in removal as an AFPAS case manager. Please ensure that you are validating your case managers quarterly to maintain compliance in accordance with AFI 36-3009, paragraph 2.3.2. If you have personnel updates within your center, Please notify the Crisis Support Program Manager to add and or remove AFPAS case managers. Disaster season is here and preparation is key. We received inquiries on how AFPAS events are created. The Headquarters Air Force Personnel Center creates and activates an AFPAS event in three ways. First, when they're notified by Headquarters Air Force. Two, when they're recognized, when they're requested by the MATCHCOM leadership, and the third way is when, the, when an AFPAS event is requested by an installation commander. Note that Headquarters Air Force determines if the AFPAS event remains local or it expands Air Force-wide. Pictured is a layout of an AFPAS case management process. As a reminder, Airmen and family operations will contact affected installations and inform installation airmen and family readiness centers of possible AFPAS cases. Our office will delegate AFPAS ass assessment cases to airmen and family readiness center lead case managers. The lead case managers will then assign cases to the primary case manager based on your local staff availability and workload. Please note that there is a new feature in AFPAS in which the case manager can review historical family assessments. This is an essential key feature for case managers to utilize when mapping out their case management process or their approach, especially if airmen were impacted by previous catastrophic events such as Hurricane Michael.
The Emergency Preparedness and Response Desk Guide was released and updated June 2019. Note that this desk guide encompasses operational guidance for FPAS and EFAC. Revisions and changes were made in red. However, I want to make sure that Airmen and Family Readiness Centers are aware that religious institutions off base are not authorized as an alternate EFAC location per the Air Force Personnel Center Judge Advocate. Using an off base religious center as an alternate EFAC would be consistent with the Air Force endorsing the specific faith of a church. Even though the Air Force is using the space for a legitimate purpose, the perception could be that the Air Force is using the space because of its religious beliefs, even though in reality it was chosen because it met DOD criteria. Lastly, as part of the revisions for the desk guide, Hurricane Michael did generate some lesson learns for crisis support. As a result, we did create an Airmen and Family Readiness Center disaster communication checklist. It provides guidelines of communication for centers and preparation for disasters. The Airmen and Family Readiness Center disaster communication checklist is found in attachment one of your desk guide. The evacuation, operations, and repatriation desk guide was released in June 2019 as well. This desk guide replaced the MEO, which is your non-combatant evacuation operations guide. This guide, the new guide, the evacuation operations and repatriation desk guide, defines the roles and responsibilities for your airmen and family readiness center. Angela, we're interested in the recent AVPASS event, event statistics. Can you please share highlights? Sure. Last year kicked off um, with a lot of different disasters, and just before we hit fiscal year 19, we had Hurricane Florence. Hurricane Florence devastated coastal areas of North Carolina and South Carolina September 2018. As you can see, there are 49 needs assessment cases, and those were the top concerns. We had pay and benefits, financial assistance, and permanent housing, and the case management was provided by 18 centers, including um, the Air Force Reserve Center as well. Did you know that this week marks the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Michael? It was a catastrophic Category 5 hurricane. We had 837 needs assessment cases. Case management was provided by 57 regular Air Force centers, 8 Air Force Reserve centers, and 9 Air National Guard Airmen and Family Readiness Centers. To support recovery efforts for Tyndall Air Force Base, ACC MAGCOM requested assistance in setting up a task force housing, assignments, relocation, and posturing, which in short was called our HARP team, to support, to support the families that were impacted. Airmen and Family Operations coordinated three teams comprised of Airmen and Family Readiness Center staff and military and family life consultants. The total Hurricane Air Force aid assistance equaled nearly $6.5 million in support of Hurricane Michael. This was a catastrophic event, but this just shows a true testament of the work that our airmen and families have done to support those families, and we're continuing to support those families. We also had the Alaska earthquake, which impacted, of course, um, Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. And so this was... Um, another catastrophic event that impacted them. In fact, during the duty day, this one happened. Then we had California wildfires in 2018. There was two cases where support was provided by March Air Reserve Base and Los Angeles Air Force Base. Then, of course, we had the, in March 2019, regional areas of Nebraska and Offutt Air Force Base. They experienced flooding from the Missouri River. One-third of Offutt Air Force Base was underwater. 
with at least 30 buildings damaged in the flood. I would like to highlight the mission partnership between Offutt Airmen and Family Readiness Center and Nebraska 155th Air Wing Airmen and Family Readiness Program Manager. They were in close proximity and collaborated crisis support efforts. In May 2019, Tulsa, Oklahoma and surrounding areas experienced torrential rain and flooding of the Arkansas River. And most recently, we have Hurricane Dorian. During the latter part of August and the beginning of September of 2019, we tracked Dorian. This storm impacted Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, Florida, and all of the East Coast with its final descent in Nova Scotia, Canada. The metrics from the disasters that we've highlighted here today, they display and highlight that it's very imperative that we continue to educate our communities to prepare for disasters. Wow, we had an unprecedented year for disasters, Angela. What were some of the AFPAS case management trends? AFPAS case managers serve as the first and most critical link for displaced families and play a major role in assessing needs, providing information, and referring to appropriate agencies. Case managers must contact their assigned cases at a minimum weekly and document assistance or attempts to contact in AFPAS. Ensure that you paraphrase and document in third person. Avoid copying and pasting email correspondence. We recently had an inquiry from one of our centers regarding documentation for crisis support. During AFPAS events, support provided to customers that created AFPAS needs assessments will be documented in AFPAS only. When customers are triaged during EFAC and provided a warm handoff to Airmen and Family Readiness Center staff, a track visit is documented in AFPAS if there is no AFPAS event or support services provided. However, if there is an EFAC activation related to a current AFPAS event, support services are documented in AFPAS for airmen requesting assistance. The case manager will need to assist the customer with creating a needs assessment in AFPAS. Remember, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. It is disaster season and agencies are offering disaster relief for airmen and their families. Airmen and Family Operations received an inquiry requesting the Airmen and Family Readiness Centers to complete actions for advertising, referral, intake, vetting, and application processing or some in submitting for an outside disaster relief agency. A legal review was coordinated with the outcome that Airmen and Family Readiness Centers do not provide any additional support for disaster relief agencies above and beyond their assigned mission to provide immediate short-term assistance and referral to appropriate agency or service to assist individuals and families facing crisis situations and offer information, education, and support services to individuals, families, and the community during deployments, contingencies, and emergencies, per AFI 36-3009, paragraph 2.1. The general rule is that Department of Defense may not provide unauthorized support to or endorsement of non-federal entities. Fiscal limitations and prohibitions on preferential treatment and official endorsements generally prohibit providing support to non-federal entities. More specifically, additional logistics support, such as intake and processing of applications, could potentially violate the paragraphs 3-2009 endorsement of joint ethics regulation. Please remember that Air Force Aid is the official charity of the Air Force that has an agreement with Airmen and Family. Refer to your local legal office for additional clarification. Hot off the press, 
Airmen and Family Operations is collaborating with AFPC Public Affairs to create program vignettes. The vignettes are a way for leadership to gain understanding and perspective of Airmen and Family Readiness Center programs. The crisis support vignette was recently released and now is available on YouTube. Subscribe to the Air Force Personnel Center and check out the video. Leadership and Airmen and Family Readiness Center staff are available to view the vignette, are able to view the vignette, excuse me, and learn the three core responsibilities of crisis support. I want to send a special thanks to the Military and Family Readiness Center staff at Joint Base San Antonio Randolph for being excellent actors. As we close today's webcast, I would like you to discuss and answer the following as a team, as an Airmen and Family Readiness Center team. What are ways that you educate your leadership and community on FPAS and EFAC? Are you exercising your EFAC annually? Do you ensure realistic scenarios are included? How do you market AFPAS and EFAC on your installation? How are you providing disaster education and pre preparedness on your installation? Identify mission partners and helping agencies. So if you can just pause and just take a moment, you can pause the video and just take a moment and just answer those questions collectively as a group. Thank you for your time, and if you have any additional questions about our webcast today, please feel free to reach out to Nate, Glenda, or myself. Take care.